This week on Africa Update. Africa is currently facing its highest level of debt in over a decade. How can this be resolved? Are we looking at another debt cancellation for the continent? Also on the program, in the season of records breaking, Guinness Book record breaking nonuplets from Mali celebrate second birthday. This is Africa Update on Trust TV, reaching you from Abuja, Nigeria's capital. I am Ayuba Ilya. Thanks for joining. The economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine have undermined the ability of many African nations to service their sovereign debts. At present, 22 low-income African countries are either already in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. This situation is likely to worsen over 2023, limiting the ability of African nations to raise the necessity finance to deliver broader social improvements for their populations and respond to climate change. Chamong Dabe tells us more. Africa is currently facing its highest level of debt in over a decade, primarily due to factors such as the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and escalating inflation. Consequently, African nations have been compelled to accumulate additional debt, leading to 21 countries being classified as either bankrupt or at high risk of debt distress. Since 2014, the proportion of Africa's debt in relation to its GDP has been rapidly increasing. Moreover, the composition of this debt has undergone significant changes. In the past, the majority of African debt was owed to official creditors, including high-income countries and international organizations like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. However, currently a substantial portion of the debt is held by China and private creditors, indicating a higher prevalence of non-concessional debt. In 2020, the G20 countries representing the majority of African creditors introduced two initiatives, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, DSSI, and the Common Framework. These initiatives aimed to temporarily halt debt payments and facilitate debt restructuring. However, three years later, the IMF has identified 22 African countries as either already in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. Among the countries in debt distress are Chad, Congo Republic, Malawi, Mozambique, Mozambique, Somalia, South Sudan, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, while those at high risk include Burundi, Cabo Verde, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Comoros, Djibouti, Ethiopia, the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea-Bissau, Kenya, Malawi, Mauritania, and Sierra Leone. The creditors to whom these debts are owed differ in their distribution. Private creditors account for over 40% of African debt, bilateral creditors hold 26.6%, and multilateral creditors possess 32.5%. Notably, China has emerged as Africa's largest bilateral lender, holding over $73 billion of the continent's debt in 2020, along with nearly $9 billion of private debt. Over the past decade, African countries have experienced a significant increase in debt service payments, partially due to higher interest payments on private loans. Even before the pandemic, more than 30 African nations were spending more on debt service than on health care. Debt service refers to the combined payments of interest and principal on public and publicly guaranteed PPG debt. Some analysts suggest that African governments are repeating the debt patterns that spiraled out of control in the 1990s and early 2000s, which eventually prompted a significant debt cancellation program. This campaign culminated in the 2005 G7 Finance Minister's Agreement, resulting in the cancellation of $130 billion in debt for 36 countries. According to the IMF Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Economic Outlook released in April, economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa SSA is projected to slow down to 3.6% due to a big funding squeeze, which is linked to a decline in aid and limited access to private finance. This marks the second consecutive year of an overall decline in growth across the Sub-Saharan Africa region. Now, to further delve into the discussion, we have Dr. Tefa Abraham, development economist, who joins us virtually for more perspectives on the subject. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us on Africa Update this hour. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yes. Well, let's begin with your assessment of the situation at hand. Is this a trap? 
Yes. Rising debt situation can lead to a situation of debt trap whereby every country in Africa, Nigeria inclusive, we have to find a way to escape because a debt trap is a situation whereby a country's total debt, total public debt, has risen to an extent whereby repayment is now an issue and the impact of that debt on the country's economic growth is also thinning out. It is also a debt trap whereby paying is becoming difficult and countries rising debt is no longer at that level where it can propel economic growth. It's a debt trap for a situation whereby poverty is also rising as, as, as an accompaniment to the rising debt stock. So if countries do not fashion out a way to escape that situation whereby interest denominated debt that are also based in foreign currency is addressed, then the countries in Africa, including Nigeria, will be facing the situation of debt trap in the immediate to medium term. All right. How would you say the dollarization of the continent is compounding this issue right now? The public debt of many countries is, de is denominated in public currencies. Nigeria, for instance, is denominated in, in, in the US dollar. But Zambia also has its own debt stock denominated in Chinese renminbi. So the more the exchange rate of these countries, Nigeria neither related to the dollar, and Zambia is related to the China to Chinese renminbi. The more unstable these 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 exchange rates are, the more country debt relative to the country's currency, which is denominated, we deal. Remember that for Africa, what is even making our debt crisis even more peculiar is that rather than having, we have a situation whereby African debt, the debt Africa owes public institution is rising, but the debt Africa owes private creditors is even rising faster than the debt owes to public institutions like like IMF and the World Bank. Now, the debt owed to private creditors is interest denominated. So as far as dealing with the situation of unstable exchange rates, we are also dealing with the situation whereby the interest denominated loans will build in external domestic cost of living for those countries, unstable macroeconomic environment, into our debt, thereby leading to the situation whereby people have to try to pay off the more we get closer to pay, the higher the debt stock becomes. So it's a situation whereby African countries will be trying to play catch up with pay in debt, but it, it will be like a mirage because it's not something that is very possible in the immediate to medium term. All right. Well, how all of this started with the COVID-19 pandemic and now the Russia-Ukraine war having serious impact on Africa's economy. How would you say that African countries are responding to these challenges? I mean, how is it res uh, I mean, uh, recovering uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic and responding also to the Russia-Ukraine war? In terms of the COVID, the COVID for every country was an economic externality, negative externality was a shock for every economy. But African countries, Nigeria inclusive, had a lot of contribution to help them address their COVID crisis. Now, as the funds came into African countries, Nigeria inclusive, one lesson from the COVID is that rather than using those funds to address infrastructural gaps in the health sector and in the social space, in terms of social access to social transfer, many of African countries were not totally accountable in terms of how well they used their COVID-19 funds. You had a situation whereby most countries in Africa that had serious deficit in the health sector had huge contribution, even from a country like Nigeria, had contribution from CACOVI, the initiative for private sector, contribution from World Bank and many other places. It was it, it, it would have been important that these funds were actually channeled in addressing health sector infrastructural gaps. Now that is one lesson from that. So even though the COVID helped to worsen our exposure to negative external shock, 
the cost is created opportunity whereby if we have invested in our agricultural sector, we would have used that to provide the palliatives that were the popular thing as at that time. But rather than having our own cassava produced locally uh, 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 locally farmed cassava from uh, sugar cane by Gabi and locally produced food so as palliative. We were using processed food, packaged food from other countries as palliative. Imagine that we use our own cassava as palliative. Our own dawa uh, uh, that was made, our own corn, our own just locally produced food as palliative. It would have really been powerful. But what we had as, as palliative, we're packaged food that we don't really have immediate control over. So COVID-19, yes, was a negative shock, but it also brought an opportunity. Then the exposure to Russian-Ukraine crisis, if we had, the Russian-Ukraine crisis brought a huge concern of, uh, uh, of access to gas and energy in Europe. Nigeria has huge gas potential. Years of not investing in this gas potential and converting it to something we can export also made us to miss an opportunity. Naturally, the Russian Ukraine crisis is affecting African countries through the agricultural, food, uh, uh, beverage, cereals, wheat value chain. Mm. That is also a situation whereby African countries would have taken advantage to invest in their agriculture. Our agricultural sector is rain fed. So the exposure to climate change, flood, extreme temperature, desertification, drought also affected our productivity. Okay. So in, in general, it's a tale of opportunities, challenges brought opportunities, but years of failing to invest in our sector as Africans made us to miss that opportunity, thereby worsening our exposure to both the COVID and the, and the Russian-Ukraine crisis. Now that those opportunities have been missed, uh, what's your assessment of how we are now taking this from, I mean, taking things from this point? I mean, now that we've found ourselves in such a debt crisis, are we responding positively? Are we taking note of the lessons? It appears that African countries are not taking or learning as they should from how we got to where we are in terms of our debt build up overall. Now, remember, Africa, African Union's project for Africa is Africa, the Africa we want 2063. Now, this Africa we want 2063 is an initiative of African Union. Remember, OAU, Organization of African Unit, was established in 1963. By 2013, Africa brought together this Africa we want 2063. 2013 to today, 2023, is 10 years. So we're already in the first 10-year plan phase of the Africa we want to see how Africa can move towards becoming better integrated for prosperity and for uh, expansion. Remember, under OAU, the goal for Africa was to gain political independence and to end apartheid. But now the idea is to achieve greater integration for, 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 for increased productivity and progress. But rather than learning from trying to achieve greater integration, African countries are still limited in their regional blocks, ECOWAS for ECOWAS, COMESA for COMESA, East African Commission for East Africa, Central Africa for Central Africa, Middle East and North Africa, and then Southern Africa. We need to address those barriers that is limiting our integration at the sub-regional level. It, isn't barriers it the reason why? Isn't it the reason why they? If you can hear me, doctor, isn't it the reason why the AFCFTA was introduced? Yes, the AFC, the African Continental Free Trade Area, was introduced as a way of fast tracking how African countries trade. But remember, the key word in that agreement is free trade. Why our borders are open to us? In terms of trade, there are still a lot of barriers that we need to address. Multiple taxation, the difficulty of attaining a single currency. Remember, in ECOWAS, for years, we've been trying to achieve using the ECO as our single currency. But the Francophone block the Anglophone bloc, everybody is retaining, is still holding back to their colonial roots, thereby limiting the potential for Africa to integrate. So it's very vital for Africa to realize those barriers and to address them so that we can achieve 
Otherwise, even with the African continental free trade area, most countries will end up being dumping ground for other countries that have better goods to deliver. Without boosting our domestic economy, African countries will not have any substantive product to put on the table in the export international trade market. So only those that have goods that are well packaged to export will end up benefiting from the free trade area, while other countries will serve as dumping ground. In that situation, you have a situation where African countries will also begin to be owing other African countries due to improper terms of trade, in terms of uh, the free, continental free trade area. Okay. All right. Well, uh, now we are understanding that the IMS, IMF has approved a uh, $3 billion loan for Ghana. This is a one of the countries that has been struggling really in the payment of debt. And also Nigeria is looking to also access $800 million. Is this the way to go, really? In, in, in the West African region, Ghana is dealing with an inflation rate that's almost 40%. Nigeria is dealing with an inflation rate that risen from 9% to 22.22% as of today. With exchange rate instability in Nigeria, with worsening poverty and difficulty to access or expand domestic economic growth, Nigeria and Ghana, it, Nigeria, it looks as though Nigeria and Ghana have no other alternative than to cash in in terms of the opportunity they have through the special drawing rights that IMF offers. So the $3 billion to, uh, to Ghana is something that is difficult to accept. But for the mean, in the meantime, it looks as though they just have to accept it. You can also see that back home in Nigeria, the president already mounting pressure on the Senate and the House National Assembly in general to approve the borrowing of $800 million, which will also come from IMF. Nigeria and Ghana are members um, uh, uh, are members of IMF, and the special joint right that was established since 1969 is a window for them to benefit. So the $3 billion for Ghana and $800 million for Nigeria is something that they, these countries have to jump on. But it will come with interest payments and conditionalities attached to them. How, how they will deal with that will depend on how the next administration for Nigeria will deal with it and how the 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 funds will be put to use both in Nigeria and Ghana. But okay. remember, the alternative for most African countries is China. But the Chinese loan also is not coming any cheap. Many countries are already putting out figures and data that suggest that China is not just going after loan recovery, but also entering negotiations that want to have ownership of the infrastructure they provide. What? Yes. So it's important that these countries jump on the, on those loans. Why they deal with the conditionalities that we go with that we, that accompanies this fund in terms of repayment. Okay, but well, uh, doctor, where does this leave Africa as a continent in the Committee of Nations, in the international community, in terms of where the, uh, on the table of you know global politics, for instance? Once upon a time, there were a huge set of countries called highly indebted poor con poor countries. HIPCs. Unfortunately, it looks as though Africa is sliding back to that regime. That is where it leaves Africa. Africa's debt crisis history. There's the first round of 1970 to 1990s. There was another round from 19 from the from, from 2000 to 2010, where many African countries sought for debt forgiveness. So it looks as if Africa now we have to go back to the debt negotiation table as highly indebted poor countries forming a debt block, forming a, a, a cartel of countries that are owing so that they can use that position to negotiate debt forgiveness. Very important because you have and, and on the other hand, you have global debtors. If the size of the debt is very high, and Ghana inclusive can come, to, can come together, form a debt club, and negotiate with the creditors for debt forgiveness and but, debt isn't. But what's the guarantee? I mean, what's the guarantee that this will not happen again after, I mean, we've seen the history, how it has been. And so if there's a debt cancellation or forgiveness, now what's the guarantee that it's not gonna happen again? Already, when countries are borrowing for huge infrastructure, like energy, like roads, like buildings, like infrastructure, the 
group of creditors will make those countries to go into guarantees. Guarantees is a political agreement a country offers to the lending institution that regardless of the change in government or economic uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, this loan will be recovered. The country has committed to pay. So all these countries are already have already guaranteed these loans, whether the Chinese loan or any other loan offered by Bretton Woods institution. So the loan build-up will be there. The only way to escape this, this debt trap, using your question, in other words, what's the guarantee that debt forgiveness will not be sought again, is to ensure that loans and, and debts that have been collected are used for productive purpose. This is an old content in any economic um, 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 discourse using the loan that we have for productive sector and opening up our economy to ensure that we become more diversified. Diversified in the sense that the sporting sector is profitable. The entertainment sector is profitable. The agricultural sector is profitable. The service sector is profitable. People that are into golfing in Nigeria are making um, profit. People that are into small trade are also making profit. The economy must be seen to be truly diversified, whereby private sector becomes the engine of economic growth and not just sectors that are public sector driven. One other reason that our exchange rate situation is looking very terrible in Nigeria is because since the movement from NNPC to uh, based on the Petroleum Industry Act, N NNPC's non remittance. Or since NNPC stopped remitting to this federation account, you can see the depth or the extent of foreign currency scarcity, thereby even making things worse off. So okay. the guarantee to ensure that African countries don't go back to this situation of going cap in hand, seeking for debt forgiveness, is to invest in our own demo domestic co economies. Okay. And when I say invest, I mean investing in potentials, in talents, in human capital that we immediately transform to output that employs people, creates jobs, and it increases our export potential. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tefa Abraham, Development Economist, for joining us on Africa Update and sharing your perspectives with us. Always coming through with very, very insightful uh, points. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. All right. Well, you're watching Africa Update on Trust TV. Coming up shortly... We'll take a look at Guinness Book Record breaking nonoplets from Mali, who celebrated second birthday. Join us again. Welcome back from that break. You're watching Africa Update on Trust TV, reaching you from Abuja, Nigeria's capital. Now, Fatuma, Kadidia, Hawa, Adama, Omo, Ba, Muhammad, Umar, and El Haji are a set of children born by the same mother and born the same day. The nonoplets made headlines two years ago by breaking the Guinness record of most, uh, most living birds at once. That's nine. They celebrated their birthday for the first time at home in Mali, an occasion attended by relatives, friends, and even their pediatrician. Take a look. We know that the nonoplets are a gift from God. Raising children is not an easy thing. Even with one child, it is difficult. So nine babies at the same time? Since I am in Mali, members of my family support me to raise the children, especially my sister. She is with me morning and evening and every day for everything that concerns the care of the children. It is not easy. Usually, the organization of the birthday is for only one child, but in this case, we end up with nine children. Nine, but we can say it's like one. It's nine, but it's the same family. They are brothers and sisters.
All right, time now for us to take a look at Roundup Africa with Chiamaka Umwafo. Officials in Cameroon say 18 separatists have disarmed and surrendered to authorities in the biggest defection since the conflict broke out in 2017. Cameroon's military says 18 fighters, including David Debo, also known as General Baron and Ekwe Jerome, popularly called General JB, surrendered and handed over their weapons in Mudemba on Tuesday. Mudemba is a town in Cameroon's English-speaking southwest region that shares a border with Nigeria. According to authorities, the English-speaking rebels, including two self-proclaimed generals, were hiding across the border in neighboring Nigeria. Leaders of the separatists who want to break away from French-speaking majority Cameroon have vowed to track down and kill the defectors. Following their surrender, the government says the former fighters will be taken to the Center for Disarmament, Demobilization and Reintegration, DDR, in Bu, capital of Cameroon's English-speaking Southwest region. The government says the defection represents the largest number of fighters to surrender in a single day and the first time two dreaded generals dropped their weapons and surrendered in to Cameroon's military. The international crisis group estimates the conflict has killed about 6,000 people and displaced more than half a million. Finally, South Africa's struggling state power utility, ESCAM, has predicted a very difficult winter, starting in June, warning that it may have to increase electricity cuts to an unprecedented level amid the country's worst ever power crisis. Many households and businesses in Africa's most industrialized economy are already facing shuttle electricity outages or load shedding of more than 10 hours a day largely due to breakdowns in ESCOM's alien fleet of coal power stations. The gap between supply and demand is expected to increase in the coming winter months as people turn on their heaters, putting additional pressure on the grid. Winter demand for power is expected to surge to about 33,000 megawatts, but ESCOM is only able to produce 26,000 megawatts. South Africa's power crisis has deepened over the past year, taking a heavy toll on a number of sectors and threatening price rises. The crippling power cuts have had a severe effect on South Africa's economy, reducing its gross domestic product by about 5% in 2022, according to ESCOM. And that's the much we have on Roundup Africa. And that's it for Africa Update for this week. You can join us next week for another time on the program. In case you've missed, you can always catch up across all our social media platforms and also on our YouTube live stream. I am Ayuba, Ilya, thanks for watching. Bye for now.